Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, December 8th edition of the Basement Academy. Before we get to another random or not-so-random thought, I'd like to begin our time with a morning prayer. I think portions of this uh, psalm will be um, familiar to you. This is Psalm 8. It is for the director of music. It is a psalm of David. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Reminding us the God who has created all things has set us as the crown of his creation to rule over uh, this world as God's representatives. So great, great psalm. What is man that you are mindful of him? God thinks about each one of us, cares for each one of us. Mm. Okay, now I want to continue on the next a random thought has to do with Wesley Yang and successor ideology. My guess is few of you have probably heard of Wesley Yang and this concept or this notion, this phrase, successor ideology. Let me start this way. Sitting down uh, with three friends, you're sitting at the table, uh, bring out a pack of cards, shuffle them up, deal out the 13 cards, everybody's holding the cards, starting to arrange them. And um, you play and you put down a card and the next person puts down three cards. Well, you don't play three cards when you're playing hearts. You, you, you put down one card. And they say, well, hearts? We're not playing hearts, we're playing gin. And the next person says, hearts we're, we're, we're playing pinochle <laughs> pinochle we're playing spades you've got people sitting at the table arranging their cards according to the way they understand the rules because they think they understand what game we're playing well i guess we didn't talk about that we just assumed when we sat down that we were playing hearts we were playing gin we were playing uh, spades we were playing pinochle and so depending on what game you're playing you will arrange your cards a certain way and you will look at those cards and conceive of a strategy for playing those cards based on the game you understand that you're playing and so, you know, we play hearts and spades in our household. And so when all the kids are back and we're sitting down and dealing out the cards, sometimes we have to refresh ourselves. Okay, yeah, in hearts, that's right. The queen of spades is worth 13 points. It's kind of bad unless you want to shoot the moon and get all the points and then that's good. Uh, okay, so you got to, you know, but in spades, the queen of spades would be good, right? You, you would want to have the queen of spades. That would be the third highest trump. And so I maybe want to hold on to that queen of spades. That's a, that's a good thing to have. So depending on the game you're playing, that there's a set of rules. And based on your understanding of those rules and what you, cards you're dealt, you will arrange those cards and you will think about those cards and you will have a strategy based on the, the game, the rules, okay? So that's, that's, start with that concept. There's a bunch of us who think justice and equality and freedom mean one thing. But what we're learning is that 
justice and freedom and equality mean something else. Wait a second. I thought we were playing hearts. Oh, no, no, no. We're not playing hearts. We're playing pinochle. Equality, for many of us, means an equality of opportunity. I have an opportunity to um, an education, to participation in our society. Now, is, is everybody having that same opportunity the same way? Not always, but equality is shifting. The, 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 the rules of the game are changing. Equality now is coming to mean equality of outcome. If you have two, I get two. If you've got five, I get five. They have 10, we get 10. So instead of equality of opportunity to labor, um, uh, to, to participate in our society for education and business and, and um, um, growth and, and, and development, and, and it's an equality of, of outcome, not equality of opportunity. After confronting some of the inconsistencies with freedom, particularly around race and the like, uh, there was one named Martin Luther King Jr. who stood up once uh, not far from here and said, I have a dream of a day when people are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We want a colorblind society. We want to judge people not, oh, you're, you're part of that race. I know exactly everything about you and I don't want anything to do with you. Rather, it is the content of one's character that is most important. And so for many of us, we thought that was the rules of the game we were playing. But now we're learning, no, we don't want a colorblind society. In fact, if you want a colorblind society, that proves you're racist. And I said, no, 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 I thought racism is when I have an individual act against another person because of the color of their skin or their racial or ethnic um, identity or group. But we're learning now racism is an entire group thing. All white people are racist. Regardless of individual actions, regardless of individual character, you are part of a race, uh, racial, racially oppressive uh, group. Um, it used to be that merit, working hard um, uh, in school, getting good grades would provide opportunities. Now, it is not merit. There are other reasons by which we judge admission to colleges or other um, uh, opportunities and participation. It used to be that marriage was a man and a woman. Now marriage is any two people, two men, two women, or more than two men and two women. It used to be that identity was my individual name. Don Meeks, part of the Meeks family, Tom and Jackie. My identity is where I'm from, uh, my name, my character, my family, my faith commitment. I am a Christian. I am a pastor, my work. So this, this network of relationships into which I have been born is my identity. And identity is about my individual character and decisions and, uh, and, and the like. Nope. That's not the game we're playing anymore. Identity is the group that you are a part of. It's, it's your race. You're a white. You're a black. You're, you're, you're Hispanic or Latina or Latinx as sometimes it's called. And, and you are not an individual. Your identity is according to that group. And so what we call identity politics is emerging. It is your class. You are rich. Uh, it is your gender. Okay. And again, no longer is male and female because we used to think gender was male and female. Like marriage was man and woman. Gender was male and female. Nope. We're not playing that game anymore. The rules have changed. We're, we're playing a different game. And, and so gender is anything you want it to be. You don't have to be male or female. You could choose to be non-binary. You could be gender fluid. You could choose this day 
to identify as male. You could choose that day to identify as female. You could choose no longer to be male. You could be a transgender female. So you could become female, though you were born as a male, you could become a female. And many, many more options are available to you. So gender game is, is changed. Used to be that our constitution was the charter of freedom. And while we lived imperfectly into that and have lived imperfectly and continue to, it is still our charter. It sets the ideal that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Nope, the constitution is a tool of oppression. Hmm, it's no longer a charter of freedom. It's a tool of oppression. It used to be that free speech and tolerance had to do with the reality that's guaranteed by our charter of freedom that we may speak up, we may speak out, we may assemble, we may protest. We used to be able to say what we think. Even if those thoughts begin to butt up against things, I don't like the way you're thinking, I don't like the way you're speaking, but I will tolerate that. And, and, and there was freedom of speech. We have a First Amendment. Nope. Freedom of speech is now you're free to speak as long as it does not offend some identity group. And if it does offend an identity group, we must stop you from speaking. It used to be that academic freedom, higher education was where you would go to pursue and, and, and pursue knowledge and generate knowledge and you would test and explore and expand and you could ask questions and you could inquire and, and you could search and research. Now you're free to speak and free to inquire insofar as it matches the narrative, the governing ideology, the, 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 so long as it does not offend any one individual. Well, there, there, there aren't individuals, there are groups, but any individual can claim offense because of their group identity. It used to be that science was about open and free inquiry and rigorous testing, hypotheses and controls and repetition and verification. Now, science is what certain people say science is. And so science around vaccines and masks and, and um, pandemics, you know, around viruses is one thing, but science around gender identity is a complete different thing. And there's, science is what we say science is, but you must trust the science. You get my point? And so the rules are changing. The rules have changed. What, what, what game are we playing? I thought we were playing hearts. I mean, when I sit down to the table and dump my cards, you know, every time we get together, this, this is the game we play, right? No, we are no longer playing that game. So I'm holding cards, but I have no idea what game we're playing, but the game is on, <laughs> right? We're playing the game. It's not like, hey, let's, let's, let's talk about the ground rules here. How dare you want to talk about the ground rules? That itself is evidence that you maybe don't even belong in this game. And so this phenomenon that I'm describing of holding a set of cards, looking at reality, quite comfortable and confident that you understand what's getting ready to happen here as we sit down to the table with friends to play the game. With all that changing, it's go, this, this concept is called the culture war or I've spoken of cultural tsunami, this new way of thinking that is washing across uh, our land. Sometimes it's called woke. Sometimes it's called identity politics. Sometimes it's called social justice. Sometimes it is called cancel culture. Into all of this cultural chaos, if we could say it that way, sitting at the table and realizing we don't necessarily agree on what the game is, we have a number of people trying to figure it out. We're, we're playing the game, but we're trying to figure out what the game is while we're playing it, right? So social commentators, pundits, academic institutions, the legal profession, faith communities, pastors like myself, individuals like yourself, government and government leaders and legislatures are trying to figure out 
the game. They're trying to shape the game. They're trying to make the game. They're trying to return the game to the game we understood we were playing. Into all of this scramble of ideas and conversations and chaos, there's a guy named Wesley Yang. Uh, I'm thinking he's maybe in his early 30s. He's not a white guy. He's Korean-American. He's not a Christian. Okay. He, on one of, he, he's just a, a, an essayist. He just writes for a living. He's what some would call a public intellectual. And he's emerging because of this phrase that in, in just one of his blog posts back in 2019, trying to talk about the thing I'm describing, like with playing game, the game of, you know, game of cards, he coins a term successor ideology. That what he's observing or what he describes, he describes this thing as a successor ideology that is emerging. Ideology is that notion, a kind of a framework for understanding, a framework of ideas, a framework of ideas that helps us understand the game, how society works or how society is supposed to work. An ideology is comprised of certain assumptions and beliefs and convictions about humanity. Who are we? What is man? <laughs> what is man that you are mindful? Just, let's just, what is man? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? That, the most basic uh, understandings, um, human nature, human identity, marriage, sexuality, family life, Law, governance, community, the common good. Um, what is work? What is merit? What is freedom? What is justice? What is equality? What is law? What is responsibility? What is rights? What is power? How does one access power? What are the right ends and uses of power? What are the right ends and uses of money and of law and of education and of health care? All of these things comprise an ideology the notion of successor, so successor ideology, successor is the one who comes after, right? So the predecessor is the one who comes before, the successor is the one who comes after. And so what Yang basically is suggesting is that a new ideological framework, a new set of rules, a new game is being played and the rules have changed completely. And so we may use the same language about equality, but it means they, they do not mean the same thing. With the successor ideology, the ideology, the framework, the, the rules of the game have changed such that when we say marriage, we no longer mean a man and a woman. We mean two men, two women, or more than two men and, and two women. When we say sex or gender, we no longer think male and female. That, that game has changed. We now think, well, you can choose to be whatever you want. And so the predecessor ideology is one based on Athens and Jerusalem, classical liberal humanism, the human ideal, human nature, human family, uh, how, how we, we live together in society, the polis, politics comes from polis, the city. Uh, understanding that there's an ideal realm, there's a transcendent, there are ideas that, that matter, goodness, beauty, truth are agreed upon. Um, and, and so Jerusalem, obviously the biblical framework. So we have kind of a, a convergence of Athens and Jerusalem, you know, from, from Greece uh, and, and from uh, Jerusalem, you know, the, the Greco-Roman understanding. Um, and so Yang is trying to, he's saying what, it, what we're dealing with is a successor ideology. Something new has emerged or is emerging. The game is changing. And so I kind of like the phrase because it's somewhat neutral. Cancel culture, woke, um, social justice warriors. These have a little bit of snark to them, right? They're, they're pejorative terms. And so what Wesley Yang is saying is that this new thing has come. It is replacing the old. That which we, under the game we thought we were playing, we are no longer playing. It's the same set of cards, right? <laughs> there's materials and there's constitutions and there's legislatures and there's work and there's, you know, an economy and all of these things, these institutions 
So the cards are the same, but the way we think about those cards and the way we play those cards and what the strategy of the game is, is completely changed. And so I kind of like the phrase successor ideology because it's kind of neutral and it's just describing a phenomenon. Something new is taking place, uh, perhaps a little bit like a Copernican revolution, right? We used to think the earth was the center of the universe and everything revolved around the earth, a geocentric understanding of the universe. And then through experimentation and study and observation and calculations, Nicholas Copernicus proposed a heliocentric, that things are actually, the earth is revolving around the sun. It appears that the sun's revolving around the earth, but actually the earth is revolving around the sun. And so a paradigm shift, and that paradigm shift sparked a scientific revolution, which has shaped our society in, in so many ways. And so similarly, a successor ideology is emerging. So I'm going to push the pause button on that. I think at some point in the future basement academies, we may kind of explore this further. I want to get that out in front of you. You can Google Wesley Yang, YouTube, you Google him, you know, you can read uh, his writings. You can also just interact with some of his lectures and presentations and interviews to hear more about this. But I think he's saying something that we're all feeling, you know, this, this, this thing that we're observing in our society the last number of years. So my thoughts are as a Christian, as a pastor, as a leader, I think I have to deal with this as kind of a fact. There's a cultural force to this that is, this is not just a one-off thing. This is really the tsunami. It is a new way of thinking has emerged. Our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and when we're gone, will be shaped by this new idea, the set of ideas. So talk to your kids or talk to your grandkids, anyone who's gone to college or beyond. How do they understand equality? How do they understand justice? How do they understand identity? How do they understand sexuality and gender? And what you will hear will be the language of the successor ideology you're going to realize they're playing a different game than you're playing. So when you might be talking about something, you, you're, you know, so you're dealing the cards, who's got the queen of spades, well, what that queen of spades means and what it represents is completely different depending on the game you play. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do I pastor, how do I lead, how do I care for you, uh, the Greenwich Church family, uh, how should I teach? How should I preach? How should I challenge? I, I, I'm not trying to grumble and complain about this. I want to figure it out. If there's a new set of rules going on in our society, I, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying we abandon the old set of rules for the new set of rules, but we have to understand this new game and we've got to do so calmly. We've got to do so wisely, thoughtfully, rigorously. We've got to, you know, get our best thinking uh, engaged here. We need to be uh, alert lest we fall prey to the new game and abandon our faith and abandon our hope and our, our love. What does it mean to be a faithful follower of Jesus sitting at the table, holding a set of cards, thinking what the game is, and all of a sudden you, the, I'm, I'm playing a different game. So how do I live not as a geographic exile. So Israel went into geographic exile. They went to Babylon. They were no longer in their homeland. But what does it mean to be a social exile, an intellectual exile? That is, that I'm no longer, the, the way I think is no longer at home. <laughs> that the, the, this, my, my ideas no longer fit the broader ideas of society. And I think this is part of what's behind the, the, the misalignment um, and this tension of, of alignment with our denomination because I believe our denomination has fallen prey to the successor ideology. The successor ideology has, has invaded, embedded. It is now the dominant way so that when we talk about certain things, it sounds like we're saying the same thing, but we're really not. And so that's part of the tension. So how do we keep our faith and hope alive as we have understood from these scriptures, as we hold on to these scriptures, 
How do we hold on to the ancient paths? How do we find those ancient paths, as Jeremiah says? Um, how do we keep from being Pharisees, right? Of lifting up the old ways and old traditions and holding on to them so tight that they become a tool to harm people and keep people down? Because this is what the Pharisees did. In the midst of the geographic exile, the Pharisees grew up uh, and then they came back. But th there were no prophets. And so in those 400 years before Jesus, the tradition of the elders uh, became kind of codified and then ossified. And then it became a bludgeon so that when Jesus shows up, he actually has to deal with the Pharisees as much as anything else, right? And so how do we not become Pharisees in the midst of this, this changing game? So anyway, that's what I wanted to share today. Um, I, I, I Hopefully you've watched all the way to the end. I'm sure these are some, hopefully have some provoking of your own thinking. Do some digging, read about Wesley Yang, the successor ideology. Um, we'll try to pick this up again in the future, but I think the real challenge is not to stomp our feet and grumble and complain and shake our fist, is say, we're exiles. Social, intellectual, perhaps ecclesiastical, that is church, church related, and in so many other ways, maybe exiles. How do we live faithfully in such a context? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of this new day, the mercies which have greeted us already and are attending us as we walk through this day. Help us to live faithfully, attentive, obedient, humble, committed to the old ways of loving God and loving our neighbor despite the exile that we may find ourselves in. Thank you for Wesley Yang and the way he calls attention and thank you for others who are speaking into this situation of a changing world. Help us to live wisely and well as we make our way uh, through this world. Praying in the name of the Savior who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God show you the ancient paths. May he give to you uh, an earnest and sincere faith and hope and love that you may live this day and every day as his faithful follower. Amen.